What's behind Trump's hold on Ohio? Welcome to Columbus on the Record. After this year's Republican primary, there can be no doubt that Ohio remains firmly Trump country. His endorsement of Bernie Marino led to the Cleveland businessman's landslide primary victory. The last two times Trump was on the ballot in Ohio, he won by a half million votes and eight percentage points. He dominates all but the urban counties. His opponents are baffled by Trump's lasting appeal. Of course, his ardent supporters are baffled by the appeal of Joe Biden. Mark Weaver, you know, it's been nine years since he became a candidate. And he's, he's still a strong personality, a dominant political force. What is the appeal, especially here in Ohio? Well, for some candidates, you have to do a lot of reading to find out about them, find out their position. This candidate was the star of the number one reality show in the country, The Apprentice. Most Americans felt like they knew him. And then he was president for four years, got a really good chance to know him. And we're largely divided right now. Some people just don't like his cup of tea, and some people really love it. In Ohio, we have more of the kind of voters who think that sort of bold, say what comes to your mind leadership is what Ohio needs. He's likely to win again this year. He's won this state twice by eight points. Mm -hmm. Is it, does he tap into a, a, an anger among the voters here in Ohio? Does he tap into a resentment? Because he's, he's just, a, he's a sort of a negative campaigner, basically. He, he is a, he has a blunt, bold force uh, speaking out what for what many people think is a messed up system of government where we're constantly in debt, where we're not respected around the world, where we have hostages in the Middle East we can't get out. Uh, it's, we have high prices at the stores. To a lot of folks, it sounds like Jimmy Carter, for those of us who remember the Carter years. And Trump comes in and speaks his mind. Even his opponents will acknowledge nobody's telling him what to say. Joe, how do you view this? I will tell you, I have the answer to this, or I should say, I had the answer to this the day after the 2016 election, thanks to WOSU. I was listening to the report the very next day, and the reporter was interviewing a voter, a Trump supporter from Eastern Kentucky. And she said, we finally have a president that speaks and, or that thinks and speaks as I do. That told me everything that I needed to know. And, I, and Mark got very close to that in, in, in mentioning his, his list of, of, of faculties, of, of appeal uh, issues uh, that, that people can relate to. And I agree, the, the, lately this, this whole thing, which is, by the way, worldwide phenomenon of the strongman, of the authoritarian figure seems to resonate with a large percentage of the population in Ohio and in some other states. You know, in Western Pennsylvania, there's a reporter who covered that race, Selena Zito, and she famously said that reporters took him literally but not seriously, mm -hmm. and his voters took him seriously but not literally. That continues to be true. And to that point, Joe, I mean, he famously in 2017 told a crowd in Youngstown that all of the manufacturing jobs from the factories that were empty were coming back and don't sell your homes because all these jobs are coming back. Now, the jobs basically stagnated while he was president. Right. COVID interfered, of course, but he didn't fulfill that promise, but it didn't hurt him in that area. In fact, he got more votes the next time he was on the ballot. Yeah. And a lot of this comes down to style over substance. I mean, Donald Trump has a style that a lot of Ohioans like. It's that no-nonsense, I'm going to tell you what I think kind of style. No pussyfooting around, you know, that none of this, uh, you know, just hanging on and, and saying whatever sounds politically correct. And people like that. What about January 6th, Mark? A lot of, even some of his pretty strong supporters, not as far, far ardent supporters, but some of his ones who were supportive of him said, okay, this was a bridge too far. That has not really hurt him in the state of the No, he, he, later that day he came out and said, everybody be peaceful and go home. And some people said, you should have done it two hours earlier. Most of his supporters say, listen, let's have a rule. You break the law, you go to jail. Let's not have a rule that says you break the law and you're one party and you go to jail and you break the law and you're another party, you don't. And so the consistency and the hypocrisy is what resonates with Trump voters. Well, I'm not going to agree that that's in fact what is happening. Plenty of Democrats go to jail for breaking the law. And the amazing thing about, about the, the, the Trump 
um, uh, litany of, 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 of acts and, and words that have resulted in the legal problems that, that is having right now is that they are right out in the open. I mean, we saw these things happening live and, and in many instances on camera. I, I, that's astounding. You know, Ohio is not a whole lot different than Michigan or even Pennsylvania. I know Pennsylvania has Philadelphia, which is a, an eastern city. But it's, it's much more, it's a closer race in Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania than it is here in Ohio. Why is that, Mark? We've seen a flip. So it used to be that the Republican Party was the higher educated suburban party and that the Democrat, or the, the, uh, the exurban and exur urban, uh, rural parts of the state were more Democrat. Yep. That is flipped now. The, what I always like to tell people is country clubs of 20 years ago, the cars out front were the Beamers and the Mercedes. They had Republican bumper stickers. And the cars in the staff parking lot, the pickup trucks and the American older models had the Democrat stickers. Mm -hmm. That has switched now. The Beamers and the Mercedes have the Democrat stickers, and the people who work at the country club have the Republican stickers. We've seen this switch in our lifetime. It's been remarkable. How much does it has to do with the struggles of the Ohio Democratic Party that Biden has just written off Ohio? Well, if, if Biden has written off Ohio, it has been because of recent history regarding Ohio voting. Now, some of that may, in fact, have originated from gerrymandering and other political experiments, quote unquote, that, that we have experienced in the last 20, 25 years. And that might change. It did in Michigan when the, 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 the gerrymandering yeah. was, was, uh, was put up to uh, public uh, input. Okay. And, and I think that will happen. Let's get to the next topic. The state of Ohio has had term limits for more than 30 years. Basically, all state elected leaders are limited to eight years in office. They have to run for a new office after eight years, or they have to find another line of work. Now, three decades later, some question whether term limits are producing better government and lawmaking. Former House Speaker Larry Householder wanted to scrap them or extend them. Current House Speaker House Jason Stevens floated the idea in December, and last week Senate President Matt Huffman agreed that changes to Ohio's term limits amendment would be a good idea. Joe Ingalls, the leaders seem to want it. Do lawmakers at the state house are they ready to put this back on the ballot? Well, it's really complicated because this would require the voters yep. to take action. So, uh, whether lawmakers want to put their neck out there to put this on the ballot is another question. Because if you look at public polling, voters still like the idea of term limits. They really do. So, are you going? If you're a lawmaker, are you going to put something out that you know the voters are probably going to defeat, and you're going to use? Political political capital doing that, um, you know, that it's a big question. Joe, is it, is it automatic defeat? If it yeah. For the voters? Yeah. Do you know, in the polling, it's amazing. 87% of the people seem to think that term limits are a good idea. And some people think that it should be a one and out. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically what they're telling you is that they are unhappy with overall, with, with the systems. You know, some people believe that maybe they're happy with their individual representative whom they know and they see in church on Sunday and so on, but not with, with the overall system. But I, I will tell you that I personally think that term limits were a bad idea, not because it empowers the uh, administration, the fixed uh, administration, that it's, that it's nonpartisan, uh, but because it empowers the lobbyists. They're the ones who know. Mark, how, how about instead of scrapping it, you change it. You say, okay, you can serve 16 years total, but you can't come back. You can't switch houses. You can't switch chambers. 16 years total, would that, would extending them a little bit, but not scrapping them, would that, could you sell it that? It feels like the Goldilocks solution. Yeah. I was a young consultant and lawyer in D.C. in 92, flying to Ohio to advise government leaders, and that's when term limits was passed. And I remember them lamenting it. But the problem the voters were trying to solve was it took 30 years for you to become Senate president. 30 years to become Speaker of the House, and it became ossified at the top. We're now at the other end. People yeah. come in, they don't know anything, and then they leave quickly. So what you're suggesting, to the extent it could be passed, probably is the just right. You could, you could say, okay, this, this would really get complicated, though, and that's the problem. The Speaker of the House could only serve eight years. The Senate President could only serve eight years, just like the Governor and, you know, Attorney General. They might term limits there. Have sort of a, a laundry list, a You want to have some seniority... So legislators know how to pass a budget and a capital bill and get things done, but not so much that young new ideas can't make the make its way to the forefront. Yeah. But 
pretty much in agreement it ain't going to happen anytime likely, soon. Likely no. not. Who's yeah. going to fund it? Who would fund that ballot issue? That's the problem. Yeah. Yeah. And then we get into House Bill 6 sort of problems. Yeah. All right. Speaking of House Bill 6, Larry Householder could be heading back to court, back before another jury. The former speaker is serving a 20-year prison sentence after his federal racketeering conviction. Now, Householder faces 10 state charges, including counts of theft, theft in office, fraud, and money laundering. Attorney General Dave Yost says a state conviction would prevent Householder from holding office even if a court overturns his federal conviction. Even if Mr. Householder's federal appeal is successful, a conviction on state charges in state court for theft in office means the comeback kid will never come back to the General Assembly. The Householder indictment comes after the state charged First Energy executives and former State Utilities Commission Chair Sam Randazzo for their roles in the nuclear bailout scandal. Mark, how common is it for a defendant to face federal and state charges either simultaneously or one after the other? Yeah, there's a doctrine called the dual sovereign doctrine that says it's not a double jeopardy problem to have the federal government pursue federal charges and the state government pursue state charges. The one of the charges that Attorney General Yost brought is theft in office. That's the one that if you're convicted of, you can never hold public office again. Recall now, although I think the jury made the right decision on Householder, I read his attorney's appeals brief. They raised some interesting points. If that case were to be overturned and it would have to go back to another trial, Householder could beat the federal charges. These state charges would be a backup to that and ensure that there would be some accountability for his actions in office. If he is convicted of both and the other conviction stands, would he, would he serve the sentences concurrently? Oh. Would they be back-to-back? Uh, -back? Yeah, he, he could serve them concurrently. That would be up to the judge mm -hmm. uh, if that were the case. You know, a couple of these things are our F1s, you know, we're yeah. talking about substantial, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the man is 64 years old. He's already looking at 20. I, uh, something might happen. I think Mark is, is correct if it's sent back or retried or, you know, yep. uh, accepts a deal or whatever it might happen to be. But uh, it's, and you know, I, I, I thought originally that when I first heard that Dave Diost was advancing this, that it was a bit of an overkill. But after I saw the actual counts, I don't think so. I think he kind of had had to do it. Joe, Dave Yost is in kind of an odd position. He, he kind of kept quiet on House Bill 6 when it was going through. The text messages that came out during the trial indicated that one reason why he kept quiet was because he had received some donations from First Energy, the company involved. Where, what, politically, what does this mean for him, do you think? Can he be impartial in this? Can he just prosecute this as the chief law enforcement officer of the state? Well, that's the golden question, and it depends on who you ask, because some people say he cannot be impartial in this because of, of his, you know, past dealings. And if you look at who received money from HB6, there's a lot of people who got money from that. So, I mean, you know, it... it it remains to be seen whether he can actually do this and do it impartially. Um, I'm sure there will be people pot-shotting him all along the way, though. We see this on the federal level, Mark, when, the, when a Democrat president and attorney general charges a Republican and vice versa. There's always accusations of politics involved. Is there any other way around? Is there any way around that? No, and this is a Republican attorney general prosecuting a former Republican speaker. Dave Yost, like Mike DeWine and Betty Montgomery, were pro they were all prosecutors before they were attorney general. Some attorney generals weren't. Cordray wasn't. Dan wasn't. Lee Fisher wasn't. He was the Delaware County prosecutor. Everyone agreed he did a great job up there. He didn't have to bring these charges. He did. I think it was the right thing to do. Yeah, and remember the original uh, federal charges were as a result of an investigation initiated by a Republican U.S. attorney. It gets complicated in that there might be uh, there could be other people charged down the road. I mean, right. folks in the DeWine administration. John Houston's name came up in some of the charging papers in the federal. His name didn't, but his executive too, which is John Houston came up in that. They could be potential rivals down the road. What, did, what troubles does that lead? Well, uh, we elect our leaders in Ohio, mm -hmm. including prosecutors and attorney generals. There will be natural questions about whether people act properly. But remember, a jury has to unanimously agree that all elements of every charge were proved beyond a reasonable doubt. And that is a backstop to any political shenanigans. Mm -hmm. How how long will the state charges, will they take as long as the federal charges? God, those take state forever. State court moves faster than federal court, typically. <laughs> will be five years before this is all resolved? No, but it could, it could be a year and a half or oh, something yeah. like that. Yeah. All right, so, so if this could happen before any appeal, as 
based on the pace of federal court is, is settled. Federal yeah. appeals go slowly. There are speedy trial implications of trials, and so I would expect the state court will move faster than the federal appeals. All right. For the first time since voters enshrined abortion rights in the Constitution, advocates have filed suit to change state law. The ACLU and Planned Parenthood Friday filed suit challenging Ohio's 24-hour waiting period before a woman can get an abortion. They argue the waiting period has no health benefit and lacks any medical justification. They say the law now clearly violates the state constitution. The suit also challenges requirements that clinics provide information about abortion alternatives and test for fetal cardiac activity. Joe Mas, you know, these, the 24-hour waiting period was here when Roe was the law of the land. Our constitution now mirrors what Roe had. Why is this unconstitutional? Now? Well, let me tell you that, and I remember, I, because I remember appearing on this panel immediately after the passage of the constitutional amendment, and what I think we all agreed on was that there was going to be some nibbling around the edges, and then and we also agreed that there might be like parental consent issues and so on that would probably be found to be okay by the Ohio Supreme Court, understanding the <laughs> political leanings yeah. of, the, of the Supreme Court. So, so this is something that might survive, but the argument is actually very simple and very clear. Why? Why do you have this 24-hour period other than to make things more difficult for the woman? Supporters of this, of this move to eliminate the 24-hour waiting period said the language approved by voters makes it clear that this is now unconstitutional. Do you yeah, agree, Mark? I don't. This is a big money maker for the abortion industry. Of course they sue. They want to be able to make as much money from killing innocent human life as they can. But let's recall, it was an interesting and political move to amend the state constitution so that we could go back to the Roe standards. But there can't be a federal lawsuit anymore. It will have to resolve in the state Supreme Court, as Joe said. I imagine that the Ohio Supreme Court will be very sympathetic to the other side of this argument. And that's how our system works. If you say it's going to be a state constitutional issue, the final word is the Ohio Supreme Court. So the timing of this, Joe, voters approved the amendment in November. It went into effect in December. It is now almost April. Why has it taken so long, three months, to get here? A lot of people are asking that question, but I think uh, you got to remember that this um, will be challenged. I mean, this, the state will come back and challenge us and defend the law. And uh, I think there was a certain concern that they don't want this to go up to the Supreme Court too fast, because eventually that's where this is headed. And if it gets up there too fast and uh, the Democrats, you know, this, this is something that, believe me, both sides, Democrats, Republicans, are going to be campaigning on this issue hard because who is elected to the seats on the Supreme Court in November will have a huge bearing on how the Reproductive Rights Amendment is applied from there on out. There are three seats up for election this time, two in, mm -hmm. well, three incumbents mm -hmm. running. Uh, the timing of this, Mark, does this make this a big issue in this campaign? Is there any chance the Supreme Court rules on this case, the appeals make it all the way to the Supreme Court and may rule on it before voters go to the polls in November? I've argued several cases that the Supreme Court, they take their good old time in deciding cases <laughs> yeah. and never moves quickly okay. uh, on typical cases. So I would not expect to see a, a ruling for several months. But this will be an issue in the campaign, though. Well, to the extent yeah. that the judicial canons of ethics allow those candidates to talk about yeah. cases that could come in front of them. And so the candidates themselves, I think, will be circumspect. Uh, Mark is correct. However, we, did, we do have recent history in Wisconsin that uh, we had uh, two candidates, a Republican and a Democrat, and were able to clearly advance the notion that this was about abortion mm -hmm. and the Democrat one. There's another lawsuit this week. Uh, advocates for trans rights and, and gender affirming care mm -hmm. sued challenging the newly adopted state law. It goes into effect next month, but it was passed and the veto was overridden. You're familiar with the story, Joe. But uh, this is two families saying their children cannot get the care they need, uh, so they're challenging the state law. Where does, where does that stand? What are the chances of this appeal winning? Well, uh, Ohio has a slightly different situation than some other states that have ruled on this. Um, you know, so it's it's going to be a big question mark um, as to how this goes from here. Um, but I think the thing that that the court is going to be looking at is is you know. Can, can this decision be made by government and um, do how much parent right is, is there? 
The rulings have been kind of mixed on this. Missouri and Texas, they put the law on hold, but they upheld similar laws in Tennessee and Kentucky, Mark. Mm -hmm. Is Ohio different than these states, similar to these states? Part of this is driven by public opinion, and public opinion across the country is at least two-thirds of Americans think it's a really bad idea for children to undergo genital mutilation or chemical castration. But this will be a legal question, and so it'll be resolved, as in our previous question, at the Ohio Supreme Court. And I don't necessarily agree that that, that is, in fact, what the gender-affirming care is. Uh, I, you know, it, it, it makes a question as to why are we talking about trans issues, only 0.5% to 1.6% of the population among all ages identifies itself as, as trans. And somehow, but I think what happens is that it's a cheap way for politicians to say, I have the same values as you do. And as Mark said, that the population has a general idea. Oh, well, let's talk about this. Yeah. Uh, it's on both sides as well. I mean, it's, it's very, they're louder on the right, but the, the left is pretty pretty adamant in their support for trans rights, especially after the yes. gay marriage issue was settled. No, yes, yeah. yes, All right. correct. Our last topic, a little, a little lighter. It has been a little while since taxpayers were asked to help build a pro sports stadium. I think the crew's lower.com stadium was the last one. That was, that was five years ago. But now the Cleveland Browns are looking for a new or renovated home. Their current stadium is, you know, 25 years old after all. The team's owners, Jimmy and Dee Haslam, say the team needs a major stadium renovation or a new dome stadium outside the city. The Cleveland Plain Dealer reports the Browns' top lobbyists are laying the groundwork to ask state lawmakers for money for the project. The good news is the Browns are not threatening to leave town, no matter what happens, so they say. <laughs> Joe, you know, the Browns are worth, according to Forbes, $4.5 billion, twice the value of what the Haslam's paid for the team when they, when they became part owners, majority owners. How excited are lawmakers going to be to help them build a stadium or renovate the current one? Oh, I don't know that they'll be excited. I wouldn't use that word. But I do think that if you listen to Governor DeWine, he thinks there's a lot of value in, in building these stadiums because he thinks they have an economic benefit. And there's a lot of lawmakers on both sides of the aisle, I might add, who, uh, you know, think that these stadiums are very, you know, good for communities. Um, and how much is the big question. Mm -hmm. Governor DeWine is telling him, bring me a price tag. I want to see the number. Mike, as an avowed Bolshevik, I love government spending. So I think it's a, I, it better have a dome. That's the only <laughs> thing. I can't imagine having a team anywhere around Lake Erie yeah. and not having a dome. Yeah. In 19 years being on this show, you know I'm against government paying for stuff like this, but I'll make a deal with the governor. If he wants to buy the stadium with taxpayer dollars, as long as taxpayers will fund a playmaking center and a world-class goalie for the Blue Jackets, <laughs> I'll make that trade. Well, this, I mean, the dome would be built outside the city of Cleveland, apparently, right. according to, out yeah. by the airport. So it kind Cannot of... Cannot be built downtown, they say. supposedly. You know, yeah. The Bears mm -hmm. have found a way to build their dome downtown. And, yes. But it's always, you know, this, this, it comes down to public money for a private venue now, the symphony wants a new symphony hall downtown Columbus. They, they've asked, they've pr promised state help. COSI, private organization downtown Columbus, gets help from the county, Franklin County government. Is there anything inherently wrong with a, a cultural or a entertainment or a sports venue getting public support? It suggests we have so much money that we can do far more things than the basic elements of what government is supposed to do. It suggests that we have enough police protecting us in the neighborhoods, that our highways and our bridges are safe, and we have so much extra money sitting around. Let's do some stuff that the charitable and private sector should do, and I just disagree with that. I wasn't here when the Browns moved the first time, oh, well, the only time. Oh, that was. Does the history help the Browns in this case or hurt them? Does the city say, okay, we're going to give you all the money you want because we don't want to go through that again? Or do they say, wait a minute, you're not going to go again? Well, I was noticing on social media when this first came out, and there was a lot of sentiment of, oh, we don't want to have, you know, we don't want to lose the Browns. We don't want to lose the Browns. So I think it scarred a certain population of Ohioans that, yes, if, if you know, it could happen again, and that they're just afraid of that. Should the stadiums last more than 25 years? I guess not. <laughs> I, was, I was in one in Athens. Isn't that amazing? It's still around. Yeah. It's been around for a couple thousand, but didn't look like you could play a football game. No there. luxury boxes. Yeah, on it that. wasn't there. There. I mean, Fenway Park's 115 years old. Wrigley Field about the same. 
Are we ever going to have a 100-year-old stadium again? They tear them down every 25 years. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get to our final off-the-record parting shots. Mark Weaver, you're up first. Uh, it's Easter weekend, and on my X feed this week, I posted an article by Charles Colson, who was now dead, but he was a Watergate conspirator, and he became a pastor. And he said, for those who don't think Jesus really rose from the dead, remember that it only took a few weeks before the Watergate conspirators all gave up the lie. And Jesus' disciples, none of them ever did. They were poor, educated people, and they went to their grave saying, Jesus rose from the dead. So happy Easter, Amen. everybody. John. Uh, Mike, um, I just want to say a few words in recognition of the folks that do the kinds of work, and many of them very dangerous works, that those of, those of us would never do. This week, six road repair workers working in the middle of the night lost their lives in the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse. All were immigrants. They came to America for a better life. May the rest in peace. All right. Joe. I just want to plug the new podcast we have at the State House News Bureau. It's called the Ohio State House Scoop. And the second episode is coming out Monday, and you can find it on anywhere you get your podcast. Wherever you get your podcast. Yeah, wherever you get your podcast, you can find it, and it's going to be on the eclipse this time. All right. I have an idea. You know, Intel Corporation, they're getting $2 billion in the state, but they have to meet certain incentives. Investments and jobs have to create so many jobs. If a team gets public money, they have to have a certain number of wins, they have to have a certain number of playoff appearances, and they have to have a certain number of championships to fully get that money. How about that for an incentive? Anyway, that is Columbus on the Record for this week. Continue the conversation on Facebook. Catch us anytime, watch us anytime at our website, wosu.org slash COTR, also on YouTube and the PBS video app. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.